You guys can be seated. Good morning, church. How are you guys doing? That good, huh? <laughs> no, it's a beautiful day out. Um, so uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Zach. Uh, I'm the pastor here at the Grove Church. Uh, for those who are new here and don't know me, you also probably heard those six verses, and you're like, man, I walked into the wrong church this morning. Um, it's totally okay. We, what we do here at the Grove is we typically, like 90% of the year, we preach verse by verse through books of the Bible. So you just happen to come on a Sunday that started with weeping and howling um, and miseries. And so, so this is where we are. That We've been going through James for many weeks, and we just happen to be here this morning. Um, so yes, you did come to like our... Uh, you know, yearly sermon about money. We're not asking you for your money, so calm down. Um, we're just going to preach through the Bible and see what the Lord would do for us. Um, before we get into that, uh, this past week, my wife and I were fortunate enough to head down to our global gathering. So as a church, we are uh, part of a network of churches called Acts 29. I'm um, actually sporting the church, uh, the, the shirt, shirt they had at the conference. Um, so we're part of this uh, network called Acts 29, and, and, and the goal and mission of Acts 29 is to be a diverse global family of churches who plant church planting churches, right? So we believe that God's primary mission strategy in this world is to plant churches in, in all the corners of the earth, the, the darkest corners, the urban centers, the cities, the suburbs, the rural places, everywhere on this earth, we want to see churches planted that herald the gospel, that raise up Jesus Christ in hopes that he would call many men to himself. So this is who we are. This is what we're about. We want to see churches planted. So um, here in Spruce Pine, we planted this church three years ago. Uh, we want to see churches planted in Burnsville and all around us. We want to, uh, I had the privilege to meet some, some brothers from Guatemala this uh, this past week, and man, I, I just am dreaming and scheming of how we can get involved in Guatemala. Um, this dude's planting rural churches in the jungles, um, and he's just, plan it's just amazing what he's doing. He's like, I mean, like he needs help because his church will grow to about 20, and that's kind of capped. Like there's just not that many more people in the jungle than 20 in this area. So he's planting these churches and, and, and doing this uh, ministry. It's just amazing. Um, and so what I want to do is to just to share a little bit about uh, what we experienced this past week, and then we're going to watch a little video that they launched this week. It's like four minutes long. Um, but this past week was amazing. So we went to our global gathering. So Acts 29 has 800 churches. Uh, going into this week, we had 799. Uh, they were praying and hoping, can we just get one more? 800 sounds so much better than 799. Um, and so we, God, God blessed us and gave us 800 churches. And so there's 800 churches on six continents, 50 two countries, over 20 languages. This is the global diverse family that we're a part of. And I really mean that we are a part of. We're not isolated here in Spruce Pine. We are part of this network. We are part of this family of churches. And it was so beautiful to go down to Orlando. And we had 1,300 people from, from, those, from those places all around the world. Um, we sang in different languages. We sang in Spanish. We, um, there was preaching in Portuguese, and we had an English translator. Like, it was just amazing. Um, we did some African worship songs and people were just dancing. It was just a beautiful time and I just absolutely loved being a part of our family and worshiping and celebrating all that God has done. Um, and so it's just been amazing. Uh, one of the things I just want you guys to know that the, one of the reasons why I love Acts 29 is because we're about planting churches. Um, and for a long time, Acts 29 was all about planting churches in cities. And they wanted to go to the cities. They wanted to go to the urban centers and plant churches in hopes that if we can get the gospel into the city, if we can get the gospel into Charlotte, if we can get the gospel into Asheville, then it'll trickle out into the surrounding areas. And they found that that wasn't happening so much, um, that people weren't necessarily uh, leaving those cities and going out and spreading the gospel. They were staying in those cities. People were moving to those cities. Now, over a long period of time, those cities, as they sprawl out, you know, like as Weaverville starts to see people come out of Asheville, as Burnsville starts to see people, you know, who live in Burnsville and go to Asheville, that could happen. They weren't seeing what they thought they would see. And so earlier this year, they launched the Rural Collective. And so Acts 29, their three initiatives is churches in hard places, we're going to support, resource, and train people to plant churches in hard places, churches where you're never going to have enough money from your internal giving to support yourself. You're just in inner city Philadelphia, you may never get there. Um, but we, you know, in, in Detroit, you may never get to a place where you 
um, have you know ex gang members making a lot of money tithing and, and supporting yourself. So we want to plant churches in hard places, uh, and, we, and Rural Collective was launched this year, and they want to see churches planted all across the globe in rural areas, including Spruce Pine. Um, and so we're a part of that Rural Collective. Um, there is no like cap, um, like we just self-identify as rural. I feel like you guys know we're rural, um, but that's where we are. And the third initiative is we want to plant churches um, where, where Islam has strongholds and, and plant churches and, and all around the world. There's 1.3 billion Muslims in the world, and we want to plant churches all around the world uh, where the gospel of Christ can be heralded. People can be freed from religion and freed from the bondage of, of, of the things that Islam can bring. Um, and so we're really excited. We've got churches um, in, in Lebanon, churches in uh, Syria. We've got a church um, coming up in Kuwait. Uh, which is just amazing. Um, and so it's really, really cool. Um, all that to say, uh, we want to see God do more. Um, and so I got a little video that they launched this week I want us to watch, um, and then it'll come up and get, and get into James. This makes you just like, want to go out and fight a war or something. Like, it's just amazing. Um, and, and, and this is the reality. Like, you guys are a part of this. You may not know it. You may have walked in there. Like, I don't even know what Acts 29 is, but the, the support you give here, the resources, the time, the money you give here goes out to plant churches um, across the globe um, and even at home. So we, we support uh, church planner Morganton, who's trying to bring the gospel to Burke County, trying to bring, uh, put a gospel bridgehead, as they said, into, in, into Burke County and, and to push back what's dark there. So it's just amazing. So I thank you guys for all that you do here. Um, and I just want you guys to feel connected and to feel a part of something bigger than we are, because we are. We're, we're a part of something so much bigger than us. Um, and, it's, and it's a privilege and an honor to be a part of that. So uh, I thank you guys for doing that. Uh, all right, so we are in James. So uh, you heard Mark uh, read James chapter five. Um, and so we're still gonna be, we're gonna be right in there. And we're gonna get into that. Um, but uh, something happened in July of 2018 uh, what happened was, uh, so we have the Tow River, the North Tow River, is that it was reported that a local mining company uh, discharged hydrofluoric acid into the Tow River. Um, and, so, and so that went into the river. It's highly dangerous, highly toxic. Um, and so when that happened, um, this is, I mean, like right here, uh, what happened was they did some testing in the river and they found that, hey, you know what? There's not just hydrofluoric acid in this river. There's also high levels of bacteria. And what they found was the city... Uh, had a sewage leak that was leaking into the river that we drink water from, that we uh, play in, that we fish in. And this all was July of 2018. And uh, um, it was, it was, they don't have no idea how long it was leaking. Um, they, don't, they don't know. And so, and so it, what the result of this was hundreds of fish were killed and just floating in the river. Um, they closed the river for a time until it could be cleaned um, and washed away and tested and, and see that it is clean. Uh, I, I believe it is clean today. So if you like played in it yesterday, I think you're okay. Um, but then again, we thought we were okay in like June of 2018 too, but who knows. Um, this story is terrifying, uh, but it's meant to, uh, I want you guys to see this idea that something can be uh, beautiful, fun, and you can play in it, and it can seem so great, but have high levels of toxicity that you have no idea are there. Um, so when we get into this idea of, when we talk about money, when we talk about um, uh, does God have a right to say what we can do with our wallet, what we should do with our wallet, does he have a right to say anything about money, what are we doing, when we t talk about these things, what I want us to see is there is a way to live our life in this world, in our culture, that seems fun, that seems great, that seems beautiful and wonderful, but it has high levels of toxicity and will eventually kill you if you continue to play in it. Um, and so I want you guys to see that as we go through this text, as we uh, explore this text, that you guys would see and feel that. And so James chapter 5, um, verse 1 says this, Come now, you rich all right, so I want to stop there. I know that's not only four words, come now you rich, but it's really important because what I feel like is so many of you just checked out right there. Okay, I'm not rich. This isn't talking to me. Like James is like, hey, you know what? This, this, this you rich, um, come now, you rich. And we're like, oh, okay, he's talking to other people. I know exactly, I know a guy who's rich. He's talking to that guy. Uh, this is talking to the guy across the aisle over here. He's talking to someone who lives next to me. So no, uh, I want you to see this. So we were at Universal Studios uh, this past week, which is a theme park in Orlando. And when you go to Universal Studios, it's pretty expensive to get tickets, like $149 for a day. Um, and, you, and you have to wait in these long lines to get onto a ride, the super long lines. Um, but 
you paid $149 for your ticket. If you want, you can pay $179 additional dollars to get an express pass. And you just pass everyone, you get to the front of the line. Um, and so I'm going to Universal Studios. I'm not paying $179 for an express pass. I will wait in line if I want to ride a ride. Um, and so we go to Universal Studios, we get in line, and all these people are just passing us. And so we, we get in. People are like, oh, do you have an express pass? I'm like, no, we need the poor line. Where's that at? Like, we're not, we're not rich. And so I, th- I think there's this uh, tendency for us to look at others who have more than us, who, who, who do more than us, and we think, well, I'm not well off. I'm not wealthy. I'm not rich. The reality is I still paid $149 to get into Orlando uh, Universe Studios. Um, just because I didn't fork over the 170 doesn't mean that I'm not rich or well off. It just means I wasn't willing to do what they were doing. Um, and so we have this tendency to look at others and think, well, I'm not rich. But the reality is if you make 25 grand a year, you're in the top 2% globally. Just like let that resonate. So you make anywhere from 25 grand or up, you're in the top 2% of the wealthiest people on this earth. You can bring it down to 18 grand. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're like, oh, I just part-time at Walmart, like 18 grand. Hey, top 5% globally. Like, like we are rich. We are wealthy. So when James is saying, come now, you rich, don't think he's not talking to you. He is talking to you. He's absolutely talking to us here today. So don't tune out. And he says this, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming up upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, again, I need to say again, I'm not after your money today. Um, my, My little tiny Nissan truck is doing just fine. I don't need a new one. Uh, Margie has more than enough shoes. Um, in fact, if, if you came up to me and you were like, hey, Zach, I just want to know what your salary is here, I'd be glad to tell you. I think you'll find it shockingly low. Um, so this is not me uh, trying to say, like, hey, I want to raise. I want more money. Uh, could you guys give more? This is not what this is about. I wholeheartedly believe that if you listen to the words of Pastor James, Jesus' little brother here, and you take them to heart, and you let them resonate and kind of diagnose your heart, and you let that change you, you will find joy and you will find your life being wrung out for the glory of God uh, by the way you spend and use your money. This is not about us. It's not about us as a church, but this is about you and your joy. The first thing I think he's saying here is that money is dangerous. It's just, it's just dangerous. Money's not bad, but it's dangerous. In fact, a pastor said it like this. He said, um, think of money as a fire. It can keep you warm it can cook your food, and it can also burn everything down around you. If you play around with the dangers of money and then you end up loving it, it can be deadly. This is what Paul would say in 1 Timothy 6, 10. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through the craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Money isn't bad. It's dangerous. We have, we have proof, so we can't sit here and be like, hey, rich people are, all rich people are evil. Anyone who has money is bad because the Bible wouldn't leave room for that. We have plenty of righteous men of faith who had much in the Bible. You have Abraham all the way in the Old Testament. You had David, you have, um, you have Joseph of Arimathea, you have Lydia in the New Testament. You have these people who have much um, and they're not bad. Money is not bad, but, the, but it can be dangerous. If you fall in love with it, If you grow to desire it, then it can lead to all sorts of evils, the Bible would say. say. And what I want you to see is that the culture around us is toxic. The culture around us is saying to desire money. It's telling you you should love money. It's telling you you should chase after money. We see um, over 360 ads a day. It used to be more before DVR and stuff. Like it was over 700 ads a day. But now we found out ways, hey, we can fast forward. We can pay for Hulu and we'll skip the ads. We can, you know, we got Netflix. We can skip ads. But still today, we, on our, on, in media, so TV, your phone, social media, we see 360 ads a day. This is not including billboards and, and flyers and things you see on the street. This is just on, through screens. 
360 ads a day. So you're, you're constantly being bombarded with, you need this, you should have this, you deserve this, this will make your life better. We're constantly being bombarded. So we, we live in this place where it's like, hey, this is awesome, this is fun, this is great, but there's this high levels of toxicity that could kill us if we're not careful, that can lead to all sorts of evil if we're not careful, because we think if we, if we hear uh, ads in our culture say, hey, you do need a bigger truck. You could, man, if you had a bigger truck, everything would just be so much better. If you had that addition on your house, if you had a newer car, if you had better clothes, like all these things, if you just had these things, it would be so much better for you. If we listen to that and we begin to desire and love those things, then it can lead to evil and death. Money is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Um, Matthew 6 Where's one of the cool things about James that we haven't covered yet? If you take James and you just kind of lay it out to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it's, it's pretty similar. In fact, James will borrow a lot of language from his older brother, Jesus, and he will um, just straight up plagiarize him, uh, which I think is okay here. I think his, his hearers knew he was quoting Jesus. Um, but he, if you just lay it out, it's like basically James is doing what I'm doing to James. James is doing it to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Like he's taking it, he's expounding on it, he's, he's talking about it, he's fleshing it out. And so Matthew 6, we see this starting in verse 19. It should be up here as well. Oh, it is. It says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. Does that sound, sound familiar? Where moth and rust destroy. And where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus doesn't care whether or not we have or do not have money, but what he does care about is how you got it, why you have it, and what you do with it. He cares about your heart. And those three questions, why do you have money? How did you get that money? And what are you doing with it? Those three questions will reveal an awful lot about our heart. In fact, Jesus would go to say, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, now we have to see this as diagnostic. One of the things we can't do is be like, well, okay, I'm gonna start going and put my treasure in places and change my heart. That's not how this works. Where your treasure is reveals where your heart is. And so let this be diagnostic. As we work through these three questions, examine your heart and be like, hey, why do I have money? Why, why do I, maybe you don't have that much money, but again, we're probably, most of us are in the top 2%, so you have something. Um, why do you have it? What's the, what's the desire behind having this money? How did you get it? And what are you doing with it? So again, being rich isn't bad, but how you got it, why you have it, and what are you doing with it? So first we see here in James 5 is, is, is why you have it. He says this uh, in verse 2, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Verse 3, your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you. You'll eat your flesh like fire. So, so there's this idea of people who are hoarding things. It says in verse, uh, you have laid up treasure in the last days, which is really mirroring what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. So we're, these, persons, these people are hoarding things. They're, they're um, collecting money and the things money can buy. And so one of the things we typically try to do with money is we try and get money for security and to try and put us away from the anxieties of this world. We want to put space between us and anxiety so we will save money, we will gather money, we will pour into a bank account, and we will get certain things to try and reduce our anxiety to, and to increase our security. And what James would say is, that's not going to work. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, and I love this part, your gold and silver have corroded. The fun fact about this, gold and silver actually don't corrode. They don't rust. And so he, he's making this extreme case here that even your gold and silver that you think is safe, that you think will always be valuable and always be good, they have rusted. They have corroded. There is no security. There is no anxiety in money. There's no, anxiety, there, there's no, uh, there's no uh, re reduction of anxiety in finances and, and wealth. In fact, all it will do will actually increase your worry. It will increase your anxiety. A Danish philosopher would say it this way. Riches in abundance come hypocritically clawed in sheep's clothing, pretending to be security against anxieties, and they become then the object of anxiety. They secure a man against anxieties just as well as the wolf that is put to tending the sheep. Right? So, so when me and Margie, um, 
first got married, we were, and he's here today, so this is be funny, this will be good. Um, he, uh, we first stayed in uh, some apartments, and it was the apartments that Margie's dad owned. Uh, and so they weren't ours, um, and it was super small. And we cared for these apartments, but when things happened, like it wasn't a big deal to us because it wasn't ours. Like if like the pipes broke or this happened or the hot water wasn't working, it was like, hey, like, you know, the person who owns this, like we didn't have much. And so we didn't have a lot of anxieties. And we thought, man, it'd be so much better if we had our own place. It'd be so much like things would just be better. We could, we could, it could be bigger and we could have more, we got nicer stuff and fit more room. And then we get a, a house. And do you think our anxieties lessened? No, like way more, like week one, this is going to be gross, but this is a true story. Week one of our um, house ownership, whole, the whole, this is going to be great. Um, our pipes backed up in our basement. We have an outdoor drain in our basement down these steps. And uh, apparently it was a foreclosure, like just years or months or whatever of like stuff getting in that drain had made a clog. And so every time we flushed, um, where we thought our flushes were going, we're actually going into our basement. Um, so we're like, hey, this is cool. Like, oh, you just flush the toilet and all the stuff goes and, and goes downtown somewhere and they like treat it and it's a whole thing. No, it was just backing up into our basement. Now, this wasn't a basement we went to very much um, because we just moved in. We didn't need, we didn't have a lot of stuff. We were like in a one room apartment. Um, so we didn't have a lot of stuff. So like a couple of weeks go by, I started to smell some things. Uh, and we go downstairs in the basement where the smell's coming from, and there's just like this much sewage in our basement. Um, I don't know what to do, so I get like Walmart bags and tie around my shoes so I can wade in this thing to figure out what is going on. It was gross, but, but this is the reality. The more we had, the more anxiety we had. The more things like, like people come over, people start, you know, like, uh, Margie, ha we have this white carpet and Margie like kind of panicked when she got this white carpet because like, oh, people are going to eat in our living room. So maybe we should put this somewhere else. So like the more you have, the more you care. If your carpet is dingy and just cruddy, you don't care if people eat on it. Like you have less anxiety. The more you have, you get a nice car. Finally, you're caring about those, those cards, like those door dings. You're parking far away from other cars. Like it literally just increases your anxiety. You will not find security and you will not find relief from anxiety and riches. No matter what the world tells you, that if you have more and you had this, man, it'd be so much better if you could just afford this and have this. You will not find what you're looking for there. You just won't. It will only increase it. So if you're chasing after riches, again, riches aren't bad, but if you're chasing after them because you're trusting them, you're trusting riches to give you what only God is, can give, what only God is able to give then it's going to lead to all sorts of evil. In fact, Mark 10, 23, 27 would say this. And Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but, with God for all, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. We've taken this phrase and we've really reduced what Jesus is saying here. Because we hear that phrase today and we're like, oh yeah, Jesus doesn't really mean that. Like he's saying like people who love money and evil people with money, it's hard for them to get to heaven. But like, but like you have to realize the disciples were like astonished. They were like, I can't believe he's saying this. Like, is this real? So like, we need to have that same level of astonishment when Jesus says how difficult it is for rich people to get into heaven. Because the more money you have, the richer you are, the easier it is to fall in love with those things. I'm not saying that, that everyone who has money is going to fall in love with those things or everyone who has money is bad. You cannot hear that. But it is easier and more tempting to fall in love with those things. So it is harder to lay down those idols, to lay down those things and follow after Christ. It just is. Just like it'd be someone who lived, you know, um, in an area of town that, and, and they were a drug addict and now they come to Christ and, and they're living where people are selling drugs. It'd just be harder for them to resist that temptation. It's harder for people with money to resist the temptation, to find security and to, and to try and find a reduction of anxiety in those things. It just is. Jesus does not care whether or not you have money, but he cares about why you have it. And he also cares about how you got it. In verse four, it says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. 
Now this is, this, pe- people would hear this, his, his Jewish brothers would hear this, and they would remember that Abel's blood cried out against Cain and cried out from the ground. And so there, he's, he's using this, this big um, imagery here that would say this is so evil, it's like murder, the blood, the, the wages that you have held back by fraud are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Here's about how you got your money. Do you get your money at the expense of others? Are you, or if you're, let's say you're an employer and you have employees, are you, are you generous or do you try and give them as little as possible or even less than they're owed so that you can have more, so you can increase your bottom line? The reality is a, a Christian who's all about the bottom line and not about the generosity and, and trying, to, trying to skate by and, and cut corners and, and save money here and save money there, and, and if they're doing that to def, in defrauding their employees the wages that they're saving, the money that they're saving is crying out against them. Like the blood of Abel cried out from the ground. Jesus cares about how you got your money. Are you talking people into things you know they can't afford, you know they don't need, so that you can make a quick buck? Are you, um, are you hurting others and stepping on others so you can make more money? We need to think about how are we making our money? There's probably certain jobs and certain areas that maybe just aren't good for the Christian to work in because it's just, it's just um, taking from people unnecessarily and taking from people and talking people into things they don't actually need and they can't actually afford and we're hurting people. Jesus cares about how we get our money. And then lastly, Jesus cares about what you do with your money. Here's, here's what James would say. In verse five, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So the question becomes, do you spend your money on this earth on self-indulgence and luxuries? Do you... Um, Spend all that you have. Is your life marked by spending money on you? Now listen, we need to be good stewards. Um, We should steward the gifts and money that God has given us. So I think as Christians, we probably should have some sort of retirement plan. We should have a savings. But the question is, is your life marked by you spending on yourself, on self-indulgence and luxuries? Money is not evil, But again, the love of it leads to all sorts of evil. So we need to examine our hearts and why do we want money? How are we getting it and what are we doing with it? Or is your life marked by using money for yourself? And so here's the part, going back to that river. We live in a culture, we swim in a river every day that is so toxic and telling us you, you, should, um, you should want money. You should desire money. Money will give you security. Money will give you uh, relief from anxiety. You should get it however you can. Here's some quick, get uh, rich quick schemes. Go enjoy these. Try and get money however you can. And then use it on yourself. Make yourself happy. Do, you know, just chase after whatever will make you happy. Um, there's popular Christian books for women that would say, man, like, hey, you've made it when you have a home in Hawaii, when your face is on the cover of Forbes as a CEO, as a woman CEO. Like, this is how you know you've made it. This is not Christian. That is anti-gospel because he, here's why. Here's where the gospel comes into this, is, is we are sinful and we have sinned against God. We have rebelled against God. And what is God's response to our sin? Generosity. Generosity. Jesus comes. He's sent. He comes to earth and he dies for us. He pours out his blood for us. He pours out his love for us. The God's response to our rebellion is generosity. If the, now, if the proper noun of the Bible is Jesus, the verb of the Bible is give. God is constantly giving. I have some incredible verses that I just want to go over because they're just so incredible and we've got to hear them. In Ephesians 1, 3, it'll be up on the screen. It says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How many spiritual blessings? Every. Some of them, just the, just, just the big ones? No, every spiritual blessing has been given to you in Christ. Like, think about that for a moment. Like, I don't even know what that means, but it sounds awesome, right? Like, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, 
in which you once walked, following the course of the world, swimming in the sewage water, right? Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The best verse ever. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Like this is our king. He's pouring out every spiritual blessing from the heavenly places. He has seated us next to Christ with Christ. Like we have a place at the table we don't deserve. We have a seat that's not for us. We are inheriting things that should be Christ's alone. And we get it. So, so when you go back to Luke and, 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 Jesus, and Jesus tells a story, the parable of, of the, um, the prodigal son, right? And we all hear that story. We all focus on that younger son. And, and there's this amazing thing happening there that we miss because we don't understand the culture. And so Jesus says that there's this one son who tells his dad, hey, I want my inheritance now. Can you just like divide up your land and give me my part now? And so his dad does it. This should only happen upon his dad's death, but he does it. So he divides his land. When, so let's, we're just going to assume he has two brothers. It's likely there's only two, there's only two brothers, uh, or two, only two sons, two brothers. So he divides it in half and gives half to one son, okay? So all that's left, 100% of what's left should go to the other son, 100% of it. So now everything the father has left should go to the other son. So what, is the, what does the first son do? He runs out, he spends it all on the world, self-indulgence, luxuries. And now he's starving. He's got no money. He's eating with pigs. And he says, if I could go home, I know my father could make me a servant. And servants eat better than this. So he goes home, and when he was a long way off, his father left his home, chased after him, got him, and gave him a ring, a robe, and killed their, their calf, their prized calf, to have a party. Now you have to see this. Everything the father just gave that son should have went to the other son. That son didn't have the right to the, to the ring, to the robe, to the calf anymore. He took all of his stuff. So everything that son is now getting from the father is at the expense of the older son. No wonder he was angry. He sees that ring, he's like, that should have been my ring. He sees that robe, he's like, that should have been my robe. He sees that calf, man, that calf was for me. When my father died, that ring would have went to me, that robe would have went to me, and that calf would have went to me. And so all these things that the father is now graciously giving to the, younger, to the other son is at the expense of the other son. And so I get why he's angry, but here's the good news, is our father, our heavenly father, is more gracious than the father in the story. And our older brother Christ is not angry that the father's giving away what's his to us. He's not indignant. He's not frustrated. In fact, he's poured out his life so we could have it. He's poured out everything so that we could just be a part of the inheritance. We could be adopted into a family and a part of it. And this is an incredible, the incredible story. This is incredible news. And so the gospel enters in and it does a couple things. And we believe that When we believe that, our primary identity, or my primary identity, is that I'm a son of God. So I don't care, um, you know, what clothes I wear. I don't care what kind of truck I drive. I don't care what kind of house I have, because my identity is not rooted in what I have, what I look like, but it's rooted in that I've been adopted into a family and bought by the blood of Christ. Because my identity, that frees me up. Like, I don't have to wear $70 shirts. I could wear a shirt that's probably too small because it got washed. Like, this is my life. Like, this is, I don't care. Like, I can drive a truck that was given to me, and the brakes don't work really well, and it's super small. I barely fit into the truck I have. Like, it, it, is, it is laughable when I get out of that thing. People, like, at Walmart literally just start laughing. Like, it's like, I can hear it. And it's just, this is, I don't need a bigger truck. Like, I don't need this stuff because I'm freed up by this. I don't, how my identity is not found in what you think about, but our culture is telling us it should be. Like, none of us today 
are wearing the clothes we're wearing because we thought they were comfortable. Like we're wearing the clothes we're wearing because we thought we looked good, because we thought we wanted to look a certain way and feel a certain way. This is, this is why we do what we do. It's, it's for us. It's, and so the gospel frees us up from that. It creates this buffer between us and our culture, us and needing approval because we can say, I am his. I have been approved by the only one I need approval from. And that is God. The second thing is this. We've been invited into the greatest drama ever. The greatest story ever. See, God is on a mission. He's rescued us from our sin and from ourselves. He's sealed us with the Holy Spirit and he sent us back out. He doesn't just save us. We all to come in here and we huddle together. And we're like, man, isn't Jesus great? Yeah, they don't tell anyone. Like, let's stay in here. Let's keep in here. Like, no, he sends us back out into the darkest places of the world, into the darkest parts of Spruce Pine, to the darkest parts of Burns when we go and we herald and preach the gospel. We get to be a part of this big story. Like every day with God the Father is like, bring your kids to work day. Like he invites us. He doesn't need us. He's not like, man, I wish I could reach those people, but Zach won't go. No, he doesn't need us, but he invites us in because we get to be a part of it. And it's for our joy and his glory. As we go out and we push back what's dark in the world with the guarantee that the victory is already ours by our king and been given to us. See, if we know we've been invited into this mission, we aren't just going to go through life and, and, and it'll change the way we spend our money and think about our money because we realize that we are at war and we're a part of this war. We're a part of this drama. We're a part of this story. John Piper says it way better than I can, so I'm just going to read it. It'll be up on the screen. He says this, I am wired by nature to love the same toys the world loves. I start to fit in. I start to love what others love. I start to call earth home. And before you know it, I'm calling luxuries needs. And I'm using my money just the way unbelievers do. I begin to forget the war. I don't think much about people perishing. Missions and unreached people drop out of my mind. I stop dreaming about the triumphs of grace. I sink into a secular mindset that looks first at what man can do, not at what God can do. It is a terrible sickness. And I thank God for those who have forced me again and again toward a wartime mindset. See, for a country to win a war, there must be sacrifice. And I don't just mean the, the men going to war. Like a lot of us are too young uh, to remember, I think probably all of us, and we're not that great with history. But when, world, when, we, when we won World War II as America, everyone sacrificed. The boys who went overseas, they laid down their lives, and the people back home, they were, their food was rationed. They grew victory gardens just so they could share some stuff. Women would, would do um, and, and learn trades that historically only men would do. Like everyone sacrificed to win the war. And if we forget that we are at war, if we forget that, that um, we, are at, we, have a war, we should have a wartime mindset, we will not sacrifice and we will not live our lives the way we should. We all love, um, being, love this kind of stuff. We really do. Uh, we think about the movies that we like. We love like Braveheart and Gladiator and Avengers and Spider-Man. We love these movies because we love the idea of self-sacrifice until we have to self-sacrifice, right? We love the idea of Spider-Man laying down his life as long as we're not Spider-Man. It's really cool when he does it. I'd love to be a part of something like that, but I don't really want to do it. It just feels like it'd be cool to do it, but I don't actually want to do it. Like, the, the joy that you feel when you see Braveheart, when you watch Avengers, when you watch people put their lives at risk for others, that can be yours. God's invited you into that, to sacrifice, to lay down your life, um, your time, your energies, your money, to lay it down and your resources and let God use it for his kingdom. Like he's invited you into this, not because he needs it, not because he doesn't have enough or he needs yours, because he wants you to be a part of it. He wants you to feel the joy that these movies are hinting at. You've been invited into a war. You've been invited into a story. We are to advance the kingdom of God into every corner and every crevice of this earth. We are going into Spruce Pine. We're going into Burnsville. We're going into Avery County, and we're going to push back what's dark to establish gospel bridgeheads in all these counties and all over the world, and we will do that, and you can be a part of that. So what do we do? 
We'll close with this. This is, this is what um, we think about. Hey, you know what, Zach? It's cool. James is talking to people who lived thousands of years ago. Uh, what do we do in 2019 um, in Western North Carolina? There's just a couple things I want to throw out there. Um, and this is for believers. Um, and so if you're not a believer in here today, if you're like a skeptic, or you're like, hey, I don't know if I, I like this stuff, um, this isn't for you. Um, you're invited into it. But if you're choosing not to be a part of it, then this isn't for you. Um, and so... A couple things we can do, and it's going to sound like I'm kidding, but the first one is just be generous. Like literally just be generous. Like know how much money you have, know how much money you spend a month, and then find out how much you can give away, and then give a little bit more since so you can live on faith, and let that be how generous you are. Like just be generous. Like find a way to be generous. Like you guys all know people. You know, you probably know like a single mom who could use some help you know someone, you probably know someone whose tires look like they're just going to blow up. Like you can help people. You can be generous. And so figure out how generous you can be, be a little bit more generous than that and let that be enough. But do it. Just figure it out. Go home, f- wrestle with it, wrestle with like your, your, your numbers at home and, and figure out how, what, what you can give. And not just here, although yes, here, but yeah, give, like be generous people. My, my wife's really good at this. Um, and it's not just money. Uh, we have just, and I, I didn't understand it for a while, but we have like just tubs of kids' clothes. And I'm like, baby, I think we're kind of done with kids. Like, we've got three, we're pretty good, we're doing okay. Like, like they're all okay. They're getting progressively less obedient, so can we just call it off now? Um, but we have all these um, kids' clothes, and so this is what my wife does. She saves up these kids' clothes. You got a, you, you got a, she got a, a mom friend who's having um, a, a, their first kid, or they're having their first kid of that gender because we have boys and girls. We got it all. We got so many clothes. I don't know what to do with it. She, just, she packs them up and gives it away to people. She doesn't try and sell it at the, at the yard sale, although I, I, that's totally cool if you do that um, to make money. But she just gives these clothes away. Um, and she's really good at that. She, she pours her life out in certain ways. Um, and so we, we give. We are generous. And then I think the other thing I want to talk about specifically because so, we don't talk about it a lot is we should give to the church. Whether that's, whether, if this is your home church, then you should give here. If this isn't your home church, go give wherever your church is. Please don't give today. This isn't me saying like, hey, we need more money. We need a bigger offering. But he, he, here's the thing. We believe, again, that God's primary mission strategy is, is the church, the local church, planting other local churches where the gospel needs to be heralded. And so when you give here, you are giving towards that. You are giving towards the war. You are giving towards us advancing the kingdom. You are giving towards us planting gospel bridgeheads all over the earth. And so just real quick to give you some things about what our church does with the money that you generously give, uh, primarily what we do with it is we use that money to equip disciples, you guys, to make disciples, so we do that with our kids. We pour uh, a lot of money into our kids' curriculum and, and a training and helping our kids' leaders uh, learn how to teach kids Jesus from a very young age. We want, uh, we want our kids to know Jesus. We want our kids to know Jesus uh, from, from all of Scripture, not just the New Testament, but to go into Genesis, to go into Joshua, to go into the kings and to see Christ in those places, to see the gospel in those places. And so we give there and we give, uh, man, I've talked about it already and I don't want to just brag about us as a church, but we give towards our women's Bible study. We, um, we did not make money off the books you guys bought. We lost money on that. Um, because I don't know how taxes work, and then, uh, or shipping. And so uh, someone else, if you're better at that stuff, take this stuff over, please. Um, and so we lost money on that deal. I know you guys paid for your books, but we lost money on that. Uh, we, we have budgeted over $1,000 for childcare so that any woman can come, whether they're single or have a husband who works, and so they can come and they can drop their kids off, and their kids will be taught the gospel while they come over here and learn the gospel. Like we, we want to equip disciples. We, uh, 10% of all of our internal giving goes back out to planting churches. And I, I love that we do that because we're still a church plant. Like we are not in a step, like we are, we are supported by outside churches. And you guys need to know like, like other churches give here so that we can do what we're doing. And then you guys give here and we do the same for others. Like we don't wait until we get to where we want to be and now we can give. No, we're giving from day one. Um, our first week of being a church plant, we gave to a church in Charlotte and we continue to give to churches today. Um, and so 10% all, I mean, and, and so 1% of that, uh, 2% of that, 
I don't know how to do math. Two uh, percent of internal giving goes globally in church planning, and the other eight percent goes uh, locally or globally, depending on on who we know and where people are planning. But the eight percent is, is places we can kind of every year decide. Hey, you know, let's take this eight percent and let's go put it over here. Let's take four percent, put it over here, and this four percent, put it over here. We can decide those things, and then the two percent goes globally. This is what you guys are giving to. Uh, another fifteen percent of our internal giving goes back out into other missions and to. Um, uh, into local things. We, we love the heck out, can I say that? Is that, we love the heck out of Greenlee. Uh, I sometimes have to check with my wife. Is that okay to say on Mike? Um, so we give so much to, to local schools. Uh, we give to people, we have money. Like, so the, this is what you're giving goes to blessing people, to equipping disciples, to planting churches and trying to um, advance the kingdom here in Spruce Pine, Burnsville, Avery County and beyond. Like this is what you guys give to. And so um, we believe and I see it in scripture, that the uh, bulk of what you give should go to the local church, but don't let that be all. Like give what you can here, give a little more than that, and then keep giving to other people, whether you support. Um, he, he, here's the thing I wanna say about church planning that I love. I think it's so cool to support things overseas, um, to support like, like we, like Acts 29 has an incredible relationship with Compassion International where you can support children. You can like, you know, uh, support a child for like, I think it's like $29 a month or something like that. Um, and then a child gets, you know, fed and taught the gospel, all these things. Um, and those are great things. But, but what I love about what we do and our focus on church planning is not only do we give to things like Compassion where kids are supported, we plant churches there so they can bring their families to church. Because that's important, right? Like, it's not just enough for a kid to be fed with food, but we want them to be fed with the gospel. And so we don't only just send food and send water, but we send church planters to plant churches where they can grow up. And the cool thing about these churches, and we saw this week, was these churches that were planting in Africa, these churches were planting in Guatemala, these churches are raising up local men to go plant more churches. So it's not just America sending out missionaries and church planters. It's, it's church planters planting churches, raising up men, like running their little like hole-in-the-wall seminaries to raise up new men who can go out and plant new churches and, and then keeps going until the ends of the earth. You think about Jesus said to go to the ends of the earth to preach the gospel. And this week, 1,300 people from 45 different countries, over 20 languages came. That's the ends of the earth, right? Like that's all four corners, six continents. We're just missing Antarctica. Uh, I don't, there's not a lot of people there, so we're, you know, I don't know what our strategy is with that, but we're just six continents. It's amazing. So this is what you guys give to. So all that to say, if you decide today to begin being generous, it will not change your heart. But if your heart has been changed with the gospel, these last things I said about being generous and giving, that's meant to equip and help those who have been changed. What do I do now? Like, okay, like I get it. God's been so generous to me. I want to be generous to others. How do I do that? So that's all that was. I don't want you to hear, and we'll end with this. I don't want you to hear me saying, hey, if you give to the church and you give to others, man, your heart's gonna change. It won't. But if your heart's been changed by the generosity of God in Christ, then this is how you live out your life. This is how you move forward. This is how you find joy in Christ. This is how you trust him and put your faith in him is by living a life that's generous. And so I'll pray for us. Um, what we're gonna do is we'll sing. We will celebrate uh, God's generosity. Uh, we'll come to the table over here on the bar. We will have bread, wine, and juice. So if you're someone who doesn't wanna drink alcohol, make sure you read the signs. We've had some instances where people didn't read signs. Um, and so read the signs. You've got juice on one side, one on the other. And so we take communion, the Lord's Supper, to celebrate God's generosity. It's really what it is, right? That God has given Christ's body for us, that he spilt Jesus' blood for us, that nothing but the blood can wash us. Nothing but the blood can make us new. And so we drink and we eat in remembrance. And Jesus said to do this often. And so we do it often because we are so prone to forget God's generosity. So we do it every week to remember how generous our God is in giving his son. And if he's that generous, what more wouldn't he give us? We can trust him. We can't trust our riches, but we can trust him. So we'll eat and drink and we will sing. And for those who are members here, those who do call the Grove home, there is a box on the bar to give, to be generous. Um, you notice uh, we don't say the word tithing here. Um, because I, we don't see that in the New Testament. Uh, we don't see tithing in the New Testament. Um, and we don't really understand tithing either in the Old Testament. We could talk about it every day. You can come to Next Steps um, and we can talk about that. But um, so what we say is 10% is like a good baseline. 
This is just us getting practical. This isn't me trying to get more money out of you. You're getting practical. 10% is a good baseline of your income. Um, I think probably all of us could do more. I don't know all of our situations, but I think we can probably live on a lot less um, based on that. Maybe that means making sacrifice. Maybe it means we don't have Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, CBS, NBC, all these different things. We don't even have all that. The last thing I'll say, because it was in my notes, I forgot to say it, is as Christians, the reality is we should be sacrificial. We sh- our lives should not look the same as someone who has the same income as us and isn't a Christian. Does that make sense? Like if, if I make X and this non-Christian makes X, my life should look like I make less than them because I'm sacrificing and I'm giving stuff away where they may not be. Is that, so are you tracking with that? Like that? That's a good way to like, hey, someone else who makes 25 grand, are they living a more luxurious life than me? If they are, then you're doing it. You're doing well. But if your life looks the same as unbelievers at the same tax bracket, then something's amiss. So I'll pray for us, and then we will sing, eat, drink, and give, um, and celebrate all that God has done for us. Father God, I thank you so much uh, for today. I thank you, God, that um, you've given us these tough passages, um, the harshness of James's language. Uh, I do want it to just to sit on us, Lord. Um, I don't want to um, back up and try and um, make James seem nicer than he's being, uh, but I want it to sit on us to diagnose our heart so we can look on how we spend our money, why we have our money, and how we got our money, and let that do some work in our hearts and, and tell us um, where we are and how we're living our, the life uh, that we say as Christians we should be living. So Father, would you uh, let this text continue to read us, Um, and for those who have heard it and want to respond through singing and through um, the Lord's Supper, Lord, would you just stir our hearts and our affections for you as we respond to your generosity? Father, I love you, and thank you for all that you're doing. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.